Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Tonight we have a late night insight, quick hit video on a house that hasn't got much talk on my channel. Um, mostly because I only own a couple that I like currently and I've never really talked about the history of this brand, which is um, mysterious and most people don't know what happened because it was kind of shrouded. Uh, it probably could be lumped into the same group as far as the, you know, BS meter goes as something like Creed, but um, uh, they are different in their own way. So the house that we're going to talk about today is the Crown Perfumery Company, and this is a now defunct house that basically turned into the house that is now known as Clive Christian, okay? And so if this looks familiar to you, this is Clive Christian's current logo, if you will, right there on the ostrich box, me lord. Uh, Clive Christian logo right there. It's because it is the exact same logo as the Crown Perfumery. So um, a little bit of background, and I am no specialist on this, but I have... Um, you know, I'm a little bit of a student of perfume history, mostly because I love the stuff so much that it's natural for me to want to kind of dive into how how it all transpired and happened. And I love learning about this stuff because it's so interesting. To me, anyways, it's interesting. This is perfume nerd stuff. And um, by the way, the fragrance we're talking about today is a fragrance called Matsuka. Okay, now this is the long discontinued version of Matsuka, uh, which if you believe Parfumo came out in 1894, and this is not like a Creed 1894 where it was really created in 1970 and they lied and said it was created in 1894. This is a actually created in 1894 scent. Um, and I guess you could classify it as a powdery sheep okay uh so it's a powdery sheep that is very jasmine heavy but i want to talk a little bit about the history of the crown perfumery uh because i think this is an interesting topic that i can maybe scratch the surface on and then if you guys are interested maybe you guys can do some research on it and maybe you can come back and teach me some things but from what i know about the house well first of all it's easy to know uh, what year the house was founded because if you take a look at one of their fragrances, it actually says 1872. And believe it or not, March 2nd, 1872 is the earliest that the house was founded. And they actually have a fragrance that is named after 1872. Now, many people think that this fragrance was created in 1872. It was not. This fragrance was created in the year 2001. And uh, 1872 was created by a perfumer named Giza Schoen, who is very well known. And um, he ended up doing some work for Clive Christian, which what, what ended up happening is, if you know the story of Clive Christian's history, the fact that they're in perfume is very strange in and of itself. Because Clive Christian used to make kitchens, high-end kitchens, extremely high-end kitchens. We're talking a kitchen set and a stove and marble countertop and stuff like that that cost more than my entire house. You know, that kind of kitchen. Uh, it's for the real bourgeoisie elite that can drop hundreds of thousands of dollars on renovating their kitchen. You know, we're talking $40,000 countertops, you know, that kind of stuff tens of thousands of dollars on, you know, particular lightings and crazy stuff like that. You know, that's the, they were in a high-end brand, but it was not perfumery back in the day. It was actually kitchens. And so from what I understand of the story, on May 2nd, 1872, William Thompson, and if you find old, um, if you find old, just so you can kind of see the back, I think this is an 80s sample, 80s or 90s if I'm not mistaken. Um, but if you find very old um, ads or, you know, pictures of the Crown Perfumery, 
you'll notice that on some of the very early bottles and the very early copy, it will actually say Thompson's Crown Perfumery Company, okay? But what ended up happening it, that um, basically shaped the life of, of Crown Perfumery as a company is the, the Queen of England, because this is an English company. And interestingly enough, if you look at their... Um, if you look at their address, look, Burlington Arcade, England. Who else do you know that's in Burlington Arcade? Just out of uh, curiosity, if anyone knows. Um, is it going to say right here? Ah, you bastards. It doesn't say. Uh, at least not here. Let me check the other one just out of curiosity. Let's see. Are you going to say... No, oh, you're not going to say. But if you look at some of Roja's stuff, uh, it actually says Burlington Arcade on some of it. And in fact, just to kind of prove my point to those of you who are um, who are doubting Thomas's, he created a fragrance called Burlington, interestingly enough. And he put a year on there too, 1819. Maybe that's when the Burlington uh, area where all of these bougie high-end fragrance companies live in, in England. I have no clue. Uh, but just an interesting coincidence that popped into my mind randomly, so I thought I'd mention it. Um, so what changed kind of the course of Clive Christian's historical arc as a house is that the Queen actually gave the Queen of England in, in uh, I think, the late 1800s. I don't know how quickly into the life of Clive Christian. I'm sorry, I keep saying Clive Christian because that's what it is now, but the Crown Perfumery, uh, I don't know how far into the, its life as a corporation uh, the Queen granted this access, but at some point she actually allowed them to use the uh, Royal Crown officially as a logo for them, okay? So they kind of got this blessing, if you will, from the Queen of England to use the crown. And many people give Clive Christian a hard time because of this very gaudy cap. And if you take a look at it, the cap has these ridiculous, almost jester-looking hats. Uh, it's this pathetic, you know, um, gold, gaudy, disgusting cap that looks like a crown. And many people kind of say that it looks cheap, and if you read on Fragrantica or Parfumo, you'll get a lot of people that mention, if you look inside, interestingly enough, there's a the little detail inside of the cap. Um, but this cap, this mold, is what was on the old Crown perfumery bottles. It's actually one for one. So many people think maybe when Clive Christian bought the house of the Crown perfumery, they changed the cap to something like this. And the mold itself is identical, everything. In fact, even the bottle shape was the exact same shape. They purchased the factory that the Crown Perfumery Company, which that factory was founded in 1872. And so whenever you look at Clive Christian's, you know, writings or whatever, they're quoting the age of the factory, not the age of Clive Christian as a company themselves. They purchased all these type of assets from the Crown Perfumery uh, in 1999, if I'm not mistaken. And then in 2000 and 2001, they started pumping out their new perfumes, right? Um, but what's interesting about the cap is it's exactly identical to the cap that was used on the Crown Perfumery bottles, except for it wasn't gold. So if you find old bottles from the Crown Perfumery Company, you'll notice that they're completely white and plastic. So Clive Christian kept the mold exactly the same, which is the most expensive part of making a bottle, is the mold for the cap in the bottle. Most people don't know that. It's not the juice inside, it's the mold and the bottle. So they kept the mold exactly the same, but instead of just using plastic, they made it metal, or sort of metal, I don't know. Or they put m metal around the plastic. You can see it's still kind of... You've got that plastic in there, right? So they put metal around it. And that's pretty much all they did. Um, and what's interesting is if you look at the logo, all right, let me see if I can get you a big, a bigger logo to see. Let's let's pull this one out. This is um, 
Oh no, it's not. It's not on here. Sorry. Let's let's do this one on black. It's probably easier to see on black. So if you look right here, most people don't realize, but it actually is the C all the way outside crown. There's a P in the middle, and then there's actually another C crown perfumery company. And this is almost like, uh, you know, you've got the crown up there. I don't know what this is supposed to be. This little blob is it supposed to be like an ink, uh, like, you know, it's stamped crown perfumery company with the Royal warrant, the Royal crown. I don't know, but, um, I just thought that was very interesting. The whole, the whole backstory behind it. Uh, and if you look at many of the old crown perfumery company fragrances, uh, William Thompson is the perfumer. He was the founder. He was also the perfumer, but what he ended up doing that kind of shot his, uh, brand into worldwide fame, not just English fame. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm sure he was most, uh, admired and used in England, but worldwide people knew the crown perfumery in the late 1800s, 1900s is smelling salts. And what he ended up doing is he took smelling salts and he added this lavender to them. So he gave them a smell. Uh, and many people love this, the lavender smelling salts that he uh, came up with. And he then also invented a crab apple blossom fragrance, which was very popular back in the day. So uh, interestingly enough, this uh, Matsuka... Mats Matsukita is the uh, fragrance that we're talking about today. And it's actually a really beautiful floral sheep, okay? A floral sheep. Uh, and it is, when you, so when you first spray, you basically are going to hit this, get hit with this powdery floral. And the powdery notes will remind you a little bit of, you know, the powderiness of Abbey Rouge, of vintage fragrances. If you've ever smelled stuff like this, this is the fragrance that actually came to mind first. This fragrance came out, depending on who you believe, because I was going to mention that Base Notes actually has Matsukita as coming out in 1929, not 1894. Uh, so Parfumo shows 1894. Um, Base Notes shows 1929. I think that's probably, I would probably, uh, usually I trust Parfumo, but in this case, if you really made me pick, I would think that Base Notes is probably correct because most of William Thompson's creations of perfume were sometime in the 20s and 30s is when he really started to pump it, pumping out these fragrances. Again, the house was living on, you know, smelling salts and bath oils and stuff like that before. If you've ever smelled this, though, La Dis by Balenciaga, which is a beautiful perfume. This is fantastic. This is one of my favorite aldehydic florals. Imagine just a very slight aldehy aldehydic opening that is mostly powdery and lots of jasmine. Um, and, you know, that um, the jasmine is definitely the star of the show, okay? Uh, but what's really interesting about this is there is this slightly green, lactonic, uh, underlying vibe to the fragrance. So yes, you do get the jasmine, it's a very natural smelling jasmine. It's almost like you're smelling the flower itself, okay? And that's it, strictly the flower. And you know, what's so interesting about this is it is so quiet and discreet. And I want you to imagine a British woman, okay? Imagine what a British woman in, in the late 1800s or early uh, 1910s, 1920s, would look like and act like and, you know, what it would be like to be around a British woman like that of that time era, right? Women back then, you know, were named after flowers. They were supposed to be delicate. They were violet. They were rose. They were, you know, those were the names given to girls back then, to women back then. They were, you know, supposed to be delicate and they were supposed to be reserved, you know, a good Christian woman uh, 
you know, dressed appropriately for every occasion and took care of her house and her kids and her, you know, and her house was in order. And when I smell this fragrance, it is one of the most, um, it is one of the most British smelling fragrances I've ever smelled, if that makes sense. I guess if you're British, you'll know exactly what I mean, but there is a certain reservedness about this. There's a certain, um, I was thinking restrained, but actually constrained might be a better word. You know, almost like, um, almost like the personality of the uh, woman wearing it had to be stifled, you know, had to be wrapped up, had to be constrained um, because she had to fit into this mold, you know, uh, and that being said, it's a beautiful smell, but it's very reserved. It is very quiet. I think modern noses that are used to smelling these big ambroxan, like today, you know, and I can still smell it loud and clear on my hand. There was a Tiziana Terenzi fragrance, and it's the very first time I reviewed a Tiziana Terenzi fragrance called Arrakis from 2019. And it is an X-ray. It's a parfum concentration, but it's very amber woody, you know, big projection for, for an X-ray. Um, and, you know, it's completely at odds with this. This is... You know what I imagine when I smell this? Just an image that comes to my mind that might kind of give you an idea of the scent profile is imagine a woman ironing a baby bonnet. And let's say it's a clean white baby bonnet, okay? And imagine that it's being ironed to go to church. And imagine this mother putting this completely ironed, fresh, clean baby bonnet on a baby uh, while sitting on a bed, baby sitting on the bed, the bed is completely crisp, crisply made, military style crispness, right? Everything is exactly in its place. Um, and any problems that the family may be having are not aired on the street. You know, they're quietly discussed in the evening time after the kids go to bed. Uh, that's the kind of fragrance that this is. It's a very uh, time-specific fragrance. Even though it doesn't smell old, it doesn't smell vintage. Like, for example, today, um, my good friend Al Manzano got me this. He sent it to me. It was very, very kind of him. I did an unboxing. Go check it out. But uh, it's a Queer de Russie from this lady, Anna uh, Zwarinkina. Zwarinkina. And uh, Anna makes amazing perfumes, apparently, but she makes this Russian leather. This smells vintage to me. This smells old. You know, this smells like it has age, right? Um, it smells like it's been macerating for a hundred years. It has that, that feel to it. Whereas this, it doesn't... It doesn't have this vintage vibe to it. Like, it doesn't feel like it's been in existence for hundreds of years. This feels like it was created a uh, hundred years ago, and, and, it's, and it's kind of changed over those hundred years in time. Whereas this, this could have been made today, but it gives you that image of a person from a hundred years ago, if that makes sense. Uh, anyone can, can wear this. This is an easy, clean floral, fresh, Shepra. Now, uh, I do think that there is some interesting facets going on underneath. I don't want to give the impression that it's completely buttoned up and boring, because I think there may be a drop of civet underneath, but just a drop. Again, the tiniest amount. This is such a British fragrance. It's so reserved and... Um, even the civet, you know, was done. I just imagine the perfumer taking the smallest pipette they could find and just, you know, the tiniest of drops of civet uh, diluted many times over is in this, right? That's the feel of the perfume. And it's really the best way that I can describe it because it's really this clean, white, powdery, floral on a Shepra base. 
is what it smells like. And it does feel like maybe there's a touch of Rudy Vetiver, but again, just a touch. Re reserved, British, remember, the white baby bonnet feel. Um, and it's a very calming fragrance too, because, and I think maybe even there's a slight touch of old school sandalwood in this. Um, but from what I've gathered, the Crown Perfumery, um, kind of re-released some of their scents. And I think all in all, he put out something like 15 or 16 different fragrances. Um, William Thompson, that is. I think he put out about 15 or 16 different fragrances. I don't know if they were all reissued in the 80s or not, or if some of them just died away or, or what. But interestingly enough, you know, when Clive Christian bought this business, uh, they bought the right to use all of this all of this stuff, all of all of these trademarks, that was most important to Clive Christian purchasing this business. Uh, and so, you can still find these old these old Crown perfumery um, bottles floating around. I don't think they're too expensive because this style is not popular nowadays. I mean, um, this would seem so out of place with on a modern woman, a man. Most men would probably have a very hard time wearing this because it is really traditionally feminine, but I will put a big asterisk next to this. For a frag head, this is very interesting as a composition to smell something like this, to smell something that's just so different. There's no way you would ever smell this composition today. There's no way any house would ever put this out. Absolutely not. Um, this would be the biggest flop you could ever imagine today because it's the opposite of what people want today. Today, people want flashy, pizzazz, champagne, you know, they want to be noticed. They want to be smelled from across the room. Uh, they want to, you know, uh, interestingly enough, I was talking to my buddy, Rich Mitch, who uh, I'd love to hear his thoughts on this, being British. And, um, he was, we were kind of just talking about the state of perfume and I was mentioning, Hey, I stayed in a really nice hotel recently. I stayed at the Fairmont, which is a, uh, upscale hotel, let's say. And, um, I, uh, told him that everyone was kind of like dressed to the nines and everyone had, you know, the Chanel handbags and all of this expensive stuff. But the perfume I smelled on people was cheap to say the least. It smelled like everyone was wearing $20 fragrance. Cheap, sweet, artificial, disgusting, uh, completely at odds with their dress, right? And I was uh, just making the case that maybe it's because you can't, people don't know you're wearing a, you can't show, there's no button you can stick on your shirt that says, I'm wearing a thousand dollar Roja Dove, right? And so because of that, these people who need this attention they don't think they'll get it wearing expensive perfume, so they just buy the cheap stuff. That's my guess. That's the only thing I could think of of why I smelled nothing but cheap fragrances on people. Even in an expensive... I mean, I could have walked to a Louis Vuitton boutique. It was right across the street. Uh, it was that kind of area. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, though. So I, I say that just to say that something like this is exactly the opposite of what people want nowadays when they spend big money. But then again, this is special for a fraghead because this gives you this point in time, this style, this reference that you may never smell again. Um, and it is a beautiful jasmine fragrance, to be honest. Uh, not the head-splitting, pounding jasmine, but a very soft, elegant, um, you know, sophisticated. Maybe you could uh, greet this woman coming into church and shake her hand as she's coming in, and you may not even smell it. I mean, you may have to give her a hug to smell it. It's very discreet, but um, it's an interesting composition. And uh, you will hear more talk about this house because obviously I have these fragrances that I want to talk about and I haven't had a chance to. I've got um, number one for men, which is probably my least favorite of my uh, Clive, you know, I don't know. It's not that it's a bad fragrance. It's just the advertising kind of puts me off the, you know, I guess if you could find this 30 mil bottle for like 100 bucks. 
It may not be bad, but don't go pay eight, nine hundred dollars for this. Don't pay retail for these. Um, and then, you know, 1872 is a great clean, fresh, citrusy, heavy summer fragrance. Yes, there's a little bit more going on, but ultimately it's just a easy to wear summer fragrance. But this is probably my favorite from the set X for men. And so I do want to talk about these. I really like this one. I think I like this more than even Roja's Reckless, which I think he tried to copy this when he made Reckless for Men, Reckless Pour Homme. Um, but I have the Eau de Parfum. I've never smelled the X-ray of Reckless, so maybe that's better. But uh, And then, of course, my favorite Clive Christian is uh, C for Men. So I'm going to do full reviews on these bad boys. And... Um, and you'll hear you'll hear more about the brand. Um, if you like Tuscan leather, by the way, C for Men, which is discontinued apparently, but uh, this is a absolute banger. It's like Tuscan leather on steroids with a touch of oud. Oh, God, it's so good! I can't wait to wear this. So that's kind of my uh, just high level overview on the House of Clive Christian and my thoughts on a fragrance that. You probably will never hear a reviewer reviewing. I mean, who's going to review uh, Mats Matsukita? Now, oh, one thing I should mention, to be fair, I can't believe I waited this long to talk about this, but there is a uh, new fragrance that the House of Clive Christian just put out last year, and guess what they called it? Matsukita. And it's a completely different fragrance, totally. In fact, it almost has nothing to do with the original. Uh, it's like an apple mate tea. Um, apple mate tea and let's see, Matsukita. Let's see what Parfumo says. Uh, bergamot, pink pepper, nutmeg, Chinese jasmine, jasmine sambac, mate tea, guyac wood, amber, balsam fir, absolute, musk, and woods. So they did this reimagining of Matsukita, but apparently it smells nothing like it. And so just be careful with that. That's That was one of the problems is trying to find uh, information on the original Matsukita is damn near impossible because everything you pull up is on the new reissued crown collection version of Matsukita that they sell for $450, by the way, which is just like, oh, uh, um, so yes, uh, you know, the crown perfume company or Clive Christian is obviously not my favorite house. I think that they're overpriced on a lot of their stuff, just like I've come to think that, you know, the house of Creed is overpriced and even Roja's overpriced, and Zerzhoff is overpriced, and all of these niche houses. Uh, even the new Amouages, I think, are overpriced, and that's one of my favorite niche houses. Um, you know, obviously, I'm a Christopher Chong fan, not a Reno Salmon Fish Guy fan, but, um, you know, it is uh, it is what it is. You know, that's where the niche world is going. So, But to get to smell some of this old stuff, as a frag head is a blessing. And somebody sent me this, by the way. This was sent to me by one of you kind folks. So um, I hope you thought I, I did it justice. It's really, really tough to talk about a fragrance with no note, notes listed, um, very little information. People disagree on the year it came out, but I hope a little bit of background from the uh, on the house of the Crown Perfumery and how it became defunct and how it became you know, Clive Christian ultimately was a cool little history lesson. So let's stop at 29 minutes. Uh, if you guys have any information on the House of the Crown Perfumery Company and the Clive Christian turnover that you think is kind of cool that I didn't talk about, leave it in the comments. I'd love to read more about it. And uh, if you have experience with this vintage version of, you know, Matsukita, also let me know. I'd love to hear about it. So appreciate everyone watching. Cheers, guys. Have a good night, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye now.